I remember when you first showed me this program, I, I definitely showed this to a lot of my friends. Uh -huh. I was like, it's mesmerizing. Like, I could just sit and watch this, honestly, for hours. It's just, it is beautiful. So this one is also single bricks, but this time the single bricks can also stick to the neighbors. If we just look at what happens, you see they fall down, ah, but, but they actually stick, they stick to the right. It's like the magnetic so, oh, to, exactly. to, a to yeah, the yeah, to yeah, either yeah. side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Then you zoom out again, it looks basically the same as Tetris. Right, so, right. so as fun so, as it is to use the Tetris bricks, there's nothing but there's particularly nothing, special. But they, there's nothing special at all. Um, I see. There's obviously no scientific literature on the Tetris <laughs> model. There should be. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of physical literature on this one, which is called right. ballistic deposition. So that's, okay. that's the one where you just have single bricks, but they stick to neighbors. Right. Because that's somehow one of the simplest ones you can imagine. So, so right? it's easier to formulate. The ballistic deposition <laughs> model, you have the, the bricks coming down and then you have um, those three choices and it's picking the maximum. Right. It's because it's going to be the tallest one. So it's either adding to the top of a stack or sticking to the side of a stack, right. but it's the first stack the first one that it, it interacts with yeah, within yeah, its yeah, three, yeah. range of three pixels, yeah. let's call yeah, them or yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas here you're saying, same idea, but it's picking one of those to interact with completely at random. Yeah. Okay. Right. And then this gives completely different behavior. Yeah. Okay. So what, <laughs> so what do we see when we do that, the ballistic deposition model with it picking randomly? Right. So then you see something like that. Let's see. So at this stage, it looks somewhat similar to what we saw I, was, before, I was about to right? say, so you I, have I'm, the impression that it might I'm look similar. I'm feeling there could be a difference, uh, but, but right you can, now... Yeah, but you, you do start to see that, you know, some yes. bits are sort of moving yeah, much yeah, faster, yeah, yeah. you yeah. actually don't really... So here it looks like it's actually pretty high up. Yes. Uh, so if we, if we kind of zoom out, we see that now there's actually really tall peaks. Uh, yes. Right, okay. Right, so, now it looks so different. Now you're right, now, it's, now it's you're, jagged. It's very different, so you have these very tall... Towers, yes, 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 thing, yes absolutely. Right? And so you have these big jumps, and they don't get any smaller. Um, and, and also very big uh, valleys or yeah, like, as right. well. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is a completely different behavior. This, this is a completely, completely different behavior. So that's a completely different universality class, so to speak. Right? Well, okay. And so, can, can you get more universality classes through similar kinds of models or...? It's Do we not, know about that? Is, is yeah, that still so the, to be discovered? That's still to be discovered to some wow. extent, right? So there's some of them we know. So we know the one that the Tetris game yeah, lives yeah, in yeah, yeah. Uh, is called the KPZ universality class. Okay. So then there is the one of the symmetric interface fluctuations, which is called the edwards wilkinson universality class, which yeah. in some sense, if you take a snapshot at fixed time, you wouldn't tell the difference from the KPZ and the Edwards Wilkinson. But if you look at a movie, you actually see the difference. They okay. behave differently. Yeah. Um, and then there's this one, which is different as well. Does this one have um, a name yet? No. Well, we call that, that process, we call it the Brownian Castle because, well, I like you it. have these yeah, towers. Yeah, yeah. Well, right? so it does, it, it looks it does a bit like, like turrets. A, and I, I'm a big fan of this. It looks a bit like okay. a castle. There do seem to be others, but it's not, there aren't that many of them. Right? So okay. it's not easy to come up with a new model that actually behaves differently from, from yeah. them. Right? So okay. if you just play around more or less randomly something that has roughly these type of features, um, there are very good chances that it's going to be one of these three society classes. And this one is an, a naturally occurring phenomenon? This, do we know this examples one, of This that? one yeah. is not so natural because okay. of this lack of cohesiveness. Right, so here you, you have these very large jumps, these kind of tall towers forming. So, um, and that in, in somehow natural processes of that type, it's not something that tends to form. If you think of this as something like a physical interface, yeah. that would not be a very natural behavior. Well, right? yeah, these, these um, I think you mentioned um, before, these kind, they're like, almost like discontinuities, aren't they? Right. They are, the, oh, they they are, are okay. really discontinuities yeah. in the so, limit. So there is a limiting process that has discontinuities. So the interface has a dense, is like, dense sets of discontinuities. It's like yeah. breaking. Yeah, 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 like snapping. Really so that's right. why it, that's right. yeah. well, you wouldn't expect it to occur um, naturally, I see. But it does, well, at least one can somehow tell oneself the story. So if you take some, there are some population genetics models that, where you could tell yourself a story that something along these lines could actually occur. And then, so in situations mm. where the uh, 
where for some reason the population is actually spread out uh, in a one-dimensional way, uh -huh. like along a beach, along a very long beach, for example, <laughs> or something like that. Ah, okay. Um, but but it so how much rare? Yeah. For currents. Oh, that's fascinating. Is is this currently what you're working on, or is this related to um, what you're doing at the moment? Okay. Well, so this one it's one project I've been working on with the postdoc of mine, and we are currently wrapping it up. So okay. So yeah. Yeah. And and then what else are you doing with um, your <laughs> with your time? <laughs> I'm sure I spent very very valuable. It sounded like I was sorry. I didn't mean that to come across as like what else are you doing, Martin? <laughs> this is amazing. We love this. But <laughs> If you said it's wrapping up, I'm guessing you're doing right. yeah, yeah, sure. other things. Uh, yeah, so what, well, so one of the projects that, uh, that I'm currently working on with a couple of co-authors um, is one where the mathematics is somehow related to the type of objects that we've been seeing here. Mm -hmm. But then, well, there isn't such an easy way of visualizing uh, the objects that you get. <clears throat> But they are related to something called the Young Mills quantum field theory. Um, it's some sort of Euclidean version of Young Mills quantum field theory, wow. which is pretty well understood. At least the free theory is pretty well understood in two dimensions. Okay. What one really wants to understand is four dimensions because time counts as a dimension. Yes. Yeah. So. And so we are currently working on well both the two-dimensional case from a different perspective from what people have done before um, and on the three-dimensional dim case. So probably in the really interesting case is the four-dimensional case. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, the tools that we're using, they just break down precisely in four dimensions. So in <laughs> principle, it, you know, you, <laughs> yeah. you can get to just below four. In some sense, you can, you know, you can work in non-integer dimensions uh -huh. in a certain way and you can really go to four minus a little <laughs> bit dimensions but not four dimensions okay uh, so at least not for the moment yeah and is that related to the actual the young mills millennium problem the young mills millennium problem if you rephrased it somewhat in probabilistic terms it would be like constructing the object that we want to construct in four dimensions where we don't know how to do anything yeah. Um, and then furthermore prove that it has a certain property which is called the mass gap yes um, the, the infamous which, mass gap yes which is another can of worms so it's even I, much much harder but okay but 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 as you say you can go sort of up to just below four just, with yeah. this kind of work well, yeah you never know <laughs> <laughs> just reaching that reaching that last little gap okay so we was this you were you thought right let's have a go at yang mills this appeals to me quantum field theory or was this more you were doing your your work here these interfaces probabilistic and it sort of somehow led towards that area like how did yeah it's more like yeah one sort of one led to the other yeah yeah and, and i think that's often how how you work as a mathematician. You know, you think about a problem, but then it raises other questions. Or it's so, oh, maybe I've got the tools to actually look at this other thing. Yeah. Well, best of luck. I hope you can get to the four <laughs> dimensions. That'd be amazing. <laughs> and thank you so much for okay. showing me Tetris and interfaces and forest fires. It's, it's great. It's been great. Thank you, Martin.